Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. The Chinese Air Force versus the Indian Air Force. There have been a lot of things spoken about how this particular contest in the sky, which may play out when the balloon or if the balloon does go up. There are loads of things we need to understand apart from just sheer numbers. I am sure a lot of us want to listen to about the status of Indian numbers. We'll try and cover that today. But this discussion is primarily talking about an air battle between India and China. What are the advantages? What are the factors that will play out during such a battle? Let's understand with Air Marshal G.S. Bedi. Sir, good evening and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Shadi. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And I'm looking forward to this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, let's open the discussion. Uh, there is there is just a lot of stuff which is spoken about uh, a battle scenario between the two. Let's kind of keep it restricted to the air to understand what are the nuances that will play out. It's not an actual air-to-air -air combat that we're talking about, but we are talking about the back end of it. So to begin with, sir, what would you like a viewer to understand about the air battle between these two countries before we go forward into any specifics, sir? Uh, yes, thank you, Vadi. Uh, what happened is uh, there are uh, gray areas in people's understanding uh, that how will it play out because China uh, as a country uh, is huge. Uh, when we come to that, uh, I will analyze it as a defense analyst, uh, purely as a professional. Uh, you would understand there are a lot of other things that will play their part, the geopolitics, the other domains, etc. But like you said, we will restrict to the uh, air war. But air war, like uh, it cannot be talked just about uh, air war. So there are other uh, issues, related issues. But, uh, you know, before I come to that, uh, let me begin this with a uh, small story which may interest you. And that is to indicate how, how did China behave? You know, what is uh, China's... Uh, character, you know, where, how has it reached today uh, where uh, it has reached? You know, now I take you back to 1958. On the morning of September 24, 1958, uh, second Taiwan Strait crisis, uh, F-86 fighters from the 11th fighter group, they took off from their airbase. Now, officially, this mission was to provide a squad for the two uh, unmanned reconnaissance aircraft, but unofficially, as it was uh, recounted many years later, the real purpose of the mission was to test the Taiwanese uh, Air Force's newly received AIM-9 uh, AIM Sidewinder missile under actual combat conditions. Now, as expected, the F-86 were intercepted by PLAF MiG-17 fighters. The ensuing battle saw the first use of air-to-air -air missile in combat and then Lieutenant Colonel Li Xuan of the ROCF, what they called uh, Republic of China Air Force, became the first pilot to shoot down an enemy aircraft with an air-to-air -air, uh, missile. According to Taiwanese records, a total of uh, six AIM-9 missiles were fired during the battle, downing three mix and damaging uh, another one. Now, the efficacy of this new design prompted the PLA to issue an urgent request for equipment upgrade. And what I want to highlight is that before the year's end, China's first air-to-air missile -air, uh, trial production line had been set up. You know, this happened in September. And before the year end, they had set up the production line to produce what? To license produce the K-5 air-to-air -air missile from uh, Russia, which became as PL-1. That is a PL story started from there. Now the following year, just see, China set up its first missile test range in a desert area in Western uh, Inner Mongolia, which is now famously called uh, Jiuquan, uh, the way you pronounce it, Satellite uh, Launch Center. And to conduct live fire testing of uh, air to air missiles, and uh, what did they fire on? LA-17 UAVs and modified MiG-15 drones were used as at targets. Now, the story does not end here. Interestingly, interesting part is yet to come. Now, although this K-5 or PL-1 was groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking weapon, it was unsatisfactory in many, many ways. The PL-1 was a beam riding system, you know, which required the launch aircraft to maintain its uh, relative orientation towards the target because it's a beam riding uh, missile. Also, uh, 
the fan shaped nature of the guidance beam largely reduced the accuracy of the missile because that we would appreciate the beam would uh, open up as it uh, moves away from the uh, source so the accuracy suffered beyond 4 to 5 kilometers these limitations meant that the missile was only moderately effective against slow moving or large aircraft such as bombers and was wholly inadequate against more agile fighters soviet missile designers were aware of the advantages of alternative guidance system that is a passive ir homing head but progress on these systems was very low now all this while when soviet engineers were struggling to come up with a satisfactory infrared homing seeker the pla had already received an unexpected gift on 28th september 1958 itself and what was this unexpected gift on 28th september 58 when a sidewinder missile was fired by a taiwanese uh, saber it failed to detonate after hitting its target which was plaf j5 now this j5 was able to land with the unexploded missile lodged in its fuselage giving the pla an intact example of the sidewinder china continued to work on this ir homing head on its own without really telling the russian for quite some time but when they could not do anything they then transferred this missile to uh, russians to uh, work on it with a assurance that you will transfer the technology to uh, us and the result was what the k13 you know at almost exactly the same copy of aim 9 sidewinder all of us have used k13 in the soil uh, mig 21s they kept their promise uh, and end of 1961 the soviets uh, sent china the examples of k13 along with the relevant technical uh, information or documentation this became the basis of a new pl series missiles the pl2 and by 1961 they had established china airborne missile academy with the result that now they have you know missiles right up to pl15 if you see there is pl1 2 Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten continued. Only the numbers missing are thirteen, fourteen for some reason, and then PL fifteen, and now PL twenty one. You know, it's a VBL ram. They are working on very, very long range air to air missile, uh, which is ramjet powered. Uh, you know, which is this is the story. This is you know when we when you see someone reaching at a place, you have to see that how did he reach there. You see the aggression or the uh, commitment with which they uh, did that. now uh, this aggression in capability uh, capability building you know is very much visible in chinese they are all over they are all over the world you know getting information getting technology uh, whichever uh, way it is possible you know just uh, i was in congo in 2005 you know uh, heading a un uh, mission there were about 60 nationalities there uh, in congo and every like we had taken our helicopters there somebody had army there somebody was fire fighting somebody was this and you know what i noticed what did chinese have chinese had hospital there was a central place called bukau and there is a massive chinese hospital there okay and now uh, later on i was a, you know when come out of then but now when i analyze that what could be the reason for chinese to have a hospital there i think it it was a brilliant strategy because hospital everyone will come and in bad shape so when all the nationalities which matter you know they are there and they land up in hospital uh, waiting for life uh, you know looking for treatment uh, they are vulnerable so a train operator probably can get lot of information out of uh, you know the whole world which is present there uh, under those condition i mean this is my reading uh, as analysis i don't know what they have in mind but i'm sure this is uh, they wouldn't have given uh, out this uh, opportunity you know they recovered lot of airborne radars from the crashed american aircrafts in uh, vietnam okay they were continuously looking for it as late as 2011 you know sikorsky black uh, black hawk uh, uh, uh 60 aircraft helicopter crashed in abotaba you know in in that uh, osama bin laden operation and in 2013 they were testing harbin z20 exactly the same uh, specifications so this is the kind of commitment and aggression they have towards building their capability okay building or the copying sir <laughs> copying yeah yeah but what do you do by copying or building i mean you know ultimately you have that equipment 
whichever way you know in in war there are no rules they say you know it's everything is fair in love and war absolutely, so absolutely. and aim is to have that uh, capability so if you can't build you know steel i mean there are uh, there are all which uh, happening there but you have to have that kind of temperament okay whether it is right or wrong or how what purpose does, uh, does it serve is a separate issue but we are only talking of how did they achieve the capability that they have now uh, it reverse engineered all the russian aircraft now same russians which helped them in the you know uh, initial aircraft or missile etc they couldn't care about uh, reverse engineering those aircraft so what do you have you have uh, you know mig time mig 19 turning into j6 mig 21 into f7b su 15 into j8 lavi surprisingly you know i don't know how but the uh, it it is said that israel transferred the blueprint to them for lavi no, one was gifted sir one was gifted probably and it it you know became uh, it's f16 class they uh, obtained uh, and jf17 also came out of it so 27 turned into j11 to 30 to j15 and uh, so on and so forth now what happens is china actually was very much army centric we all know everything still starts with pla right However, the war with Vietnam in 1979 revealed a lot of gaps in their joint operations. They realized that it won't work like that. You know, you can't have just army leading and dictating air operations. You need much more jointness and little bit of decentralized decentralization on air aspects is uh, necessary. And we would know that till about 1980, they did not have an all-weather uh, potent uh, fighter. Then the the uh, you know what is the point was i think 1990 gulf war when they watched these americans you know the operating the networking the net centric operation the precision guiding and the kind of air war though there was no air opposition but the kind of air war had effect on uh, on the battle and they presumed that the kind of battle they would fight in their eastern front etc may not have so much of ground opposition and they can probably uh, achieve a similar effect uh, with the air power that they focused very very heavily uh, on air power so there's this modern air power uh, that you see is essentially the uh, uh, result of that and now they have j20 like we say comparable to f22 and j31 f35 j20 engine was the air 31 russian but now they have developed uh, you know ws15 which is equivalent to uh, pratt and whitney 119 which is powering f22 and for the ws21 uh, is under uh, progress now uh, interestingly in all these years we ourselves were so west centric you know india was so much west centric because that's where the trouble came from uh, we hardly bothered about china china was only a paper contingency in many of the exercises uh, uh, i know for sure okay but then you know uh, you would remember george fernandez as defense minister in the 95 96 made a statement that actually china is enemy number one that is where our entire focus uh, i won't say entire focus shifted there but at least we started thinking about uh, china seriously and i know that as a youngster in seventh squadron in miraj squadron we you know started seriously thinking about addressing um uh, you know the targets in the same topography as would be available in uh, china that was the uh, starting point so what are we up against uh, after all that you know now you see just just a little overview uh, they have an economy of almost 17 trillion dollars which is almost you know four to five times uh, that of indian economy in absolute terms you see pvp what we say the purchasing power parity uh, will work more for per capita income or domestic consumption it does not work when you have to buy arms and ammunition from foreign country you know then pvp has no value your absolute economy needs to be uh, very very uh, strong you know the defense budget is almost 250 billion dollars which is more than three times that of uh, india okay their aviation industry corporation of china you know avic what they call you know it was established in 70 10 may 70 today it houses almost 450000 people and has a revenue of 70 billion dollars uh, worth revenue it's a you know at uh, good about 150 or 160th position in the fortune 500 companies uh, in the world as compared to that we have hl our major uh, aircraft uh, manufacturer 
it was incidentally established in december 40 nationalized in 42 and it has only about 30000 people with about 3 to 4 billion dollars of revenue so there is lot of catching up to uh, do here aircraft they have close to 1800 fighter bombers you know you must have heard it in many uh, times and almost about 800 of them are fourth gen which is about two and half times that of india if we say about 700 uh fighters in that class personal about three times that of uh, indian air force large fleet of almost 29 aw and c aircraft 19 aerial refuelers 200 plus uavs and they have recently tested supersonic you know mark 3 uh, rocket propelled uh, uav or which can be dropped from h6 uh, bomber and then it will go you know and they are uh, likely to achieve very superior isr capability uh, with this and if it gets armed then it's a uh, different story now potent air defense radars and missiles like hq9 they have surface wave radars which probably uh, is a protection against arm also potent rocket force uh, i'm not going into details we can probably talk about it later later in question answers if it comes up and first class border uh, infrastructure they have their own space navigation system vedu with 35 satellites and incidentally the largest uh, constellation of uh, uh, navigation satellites uh, gps uh, american gps or russian glonass or european galileo does not have these many uh, satellites gps i believe has about 31 uh, and uh, even glonass little under 30 and navic the indian one if it comes up whenever it comes up will start with 11 hopefully will uh, improve uh, subsequently now they have their own uh, tiangong space station you know uh, and they have uh, demonstrated asat uh, direct ascent anti satellite capability they have also demonstrated a robotic arm you know what happens is robotic arm means it will go and capture a satellite they demonstrated this that they they picked up one of their own satellites and uh, put it into that uh, orbit you know graveyard orbit what they call beyond the geostationary orbit from there where a satellite will never return and very few satellites are there but you see it's a style statement it's a statement that we have this capability and tomorrow if a satellite is troubling us beyond a point uh, we can uh, take it out great progress in hypersonic technology and they have just demonstrated first you know fractional orbital uh, launch using a hypersonic uh, glide vehicle um, just for audience what it means is fractional orbital means uh, orbital is that it keeps going round and round it stays in the orbit fractional orbit is that i can call up this orbit any time you know now see what is the what is the typical part of this you when you launched a ballistic missile or when you launch probably you could predict its tra- uh, trajectory you know it had a particular range it would go to a point then it will start gliding and it will come to a, a point you could predict its target somewhat but with this thing it can keep going around in orbital you don't know where will it enter the space uh, earth you know you can make it enter at any place so this one they demonstrated that after going around the complete earth it uh, you know crashed in china from where it was launched saying that it has a range of 40000 kilometers you know uh, the entire earth okay now it is also conducted land based mid course anti ballistic missile test so what happens is that capability is also difficult to uh, achieve so overall if i say uh, capability of china is almost more than three times in every aspect that we have okay and the aspects that which we don't have obviously that capability would be infinity because uh, if we are zero then uh, they are uh, infinite now uh, after covering all this i think i'll stop here and let you ask with then how do we fight them if that is the uh, parity if you are going to ask me this question uh, let me answer this uh, in all this capability you must have noticed that i did not talk about nuclear weapons right even the ballistic missiles etc try people think that what kind of warhead will it have uh, uh, i didn't talk about it that's because india and china are the only two nuclear powers who have a declared no first use policy so the conflict in my opinion between india and china will essentially remain in the realm of conventional uh, operations so we can conveniently take out nuclear uh, out of the game now i also understand uh, and we should agree 
that India will not show any premeditated aggression against China. Other than our legitimate areas, we have no interest in China, actually. No one has uh, interest, in fact. You know, just another anecdotal information while uh, I was in London, uh, in diplomatic circles, you know, you meet all nationalities. And uh, there were people from, uh, attaches from Pakistan also. So jokingly, we would say, once I asked them, I said, you guys are so close to China. I'm sure a lot of your generals must have bought uh, huge plots and huge property in China. And he said, no, sir, no one wants to go there. They are all heading towards America, you know. So uh, it's, it's just anecdotal, like I say. But, you know, other than guarding your own interest, you really don't have much uh, interest uh, uh, in China. We don't have any plans to run over any Chinese territory, in my opinion. We are interested in guarding our legitimate area, but with credible deterrence. I mean, not by begging with authority. For which we must have certain degree of offensive capability. It, you know, offense is the best form of defense, like they say. So you may not need offensive capability to, like I say, run over China, but you definitely need to have decent offensive capability to effectively uh, deter him. So this equation on the air war we are talking about has to be seen in that context. Any capability is not uniformly distributed. You know, when I say someone is three times stronger than me, he's not three times stronger at all points. You know, overall magnitude may be three times stronger. Now, there are strong points and there are weak points. Okay. The trick is to pitch your strong points against enemy weak points. You know, say you know yourself and you know your uh, enemy uh, well. You have to strategize. Now, as a student of military history, uh, you read everything from the point of view of military history. You know, even if we take uh, our epics, you know, Ramayana or Mahabharata, okay? We all have grown up uh, reading those battles uh, which were fought, okay? And if, like I said, you purely look at them from uh, lessons in military history, uh, keeping the religious sentiments aside, uh, you would find that many times people did come up against adversaries uh, which were not possible to be killed because they were blessed with some boon or some blessing, so it was not possible to kill them. But the fact is that even that boon or blessing did leave some vulnerability. You know, it was always there. So it is nature that no one can be omnipotent. Okay, it is that these uh, you know warriors then strategized, found out those vulnerabilities whichever way, and then used them uh, to their advantage to gain uh, you know the the right solution. Now I agree that only strategy is not enough. You know, there has to be reasonable power available for that strategy to ride on. I mean, you can't be just 100 is to 1 and say only strategy will uh, work. I mean, though near parity would be desirable, but even if it's you don't have parity, the strategy will play a great role. Now, the biggest difference, and thankfully so, is that India is a democracy, which China is not. The army there belongs to the party not to the nation, you know. So while uh, their progress is envious, democracies have their own challenges, like uh, we know, and which probably we will overcome with government's current push on, uh, you know, modernization and uh, Atam Nehru. But even then, there must be something, something we must have built up or some deterrence must be there that uh, our stance has become more firm. It is visible, you know. Uh, you've heard our external affairs minister's uh, statements on uh, China. You know, it's popularly come to be known as Jai Shankar diplomacy. I read it in the paper uh, somewhere in Uganda. I made some uh, statements. Now, there must be something, you know, uh, based on which he's becoming a little bold or making uh, those statements. So, what is that? Okay. To come to specifics, now, what are our uh, advantages? Our Air Force is battle hardened through wars of 65 and uh, 71. And recently, Kargil. Incidentally, we have real-time experience of fighting in high altitude, which we learned uh, the hard way. So anybody who starts afresh will have a tough time. China's last war experience was actually in 79, you know, in Vietnam. After that, uh, they have uh, uh, only simulating or war gaming. They will help to an extent, but real battle experience is of great advantage. We regularly do international exercises, thus gaining a lot of experience. China probably exercises only with Pakistan. 
though i understand it must be gaining some tactics because pakistan in turn exercises with the you know foreign uh, air forces so they must be gaining something but direct experience is uh, something uh, very different uh, i am myself witness to exercise indra dhanush you know which happened in uk while i was there our indian people came and i used to attend their briefings and debriefings uh, the those exercises instilled a lot of value lot of value if you don't do those exercises your tactics your you know the way you are looking at war uh, is going to be entirely different now chinese philosophy has been based on no contact warfare you know to achieve victory at minimum cost that is why they probably invested in lot of long range uh, vectors what we see rocket force or uh, other things so when it comes to contact warfare or you know one to one facing each other in the air probably i feel uh, we will have a uh, great edge another aspect is 3500 kilometers of almost you know 3488 to be precise is the border with india completely under their western theater command but it has very limited airfield uh, you know against india in that region kashgar is way north about 650 kilometers from the line of action and actually if from kashgar you know you draw a line and they have to reach over shrinagar their standard fighters or something they have to overfly pok now now if they overfly pok that's another game you know does it get pakistan into conflict or you know if a, if an aircraft appears from pakistan territory even if it's chinese aircraft what do i treat it as is a different uh, paradigm altogether okay but what happens is the other two airfields are you know hotan and uh, garhwanza now this uh, uh, which are about 300 to 400 kilometers or 350 to 400 kilometers uh, with an action this uh, hotan or kashgar are somewhat like our srinagar altitude about 5000 feet or 4500 uh, feet but gargunza is 14200 feet you know lays to 10500 feet and this is 14200 uh, feet and the way capability or the load carrying capability uh, capability reduces is not linear in function you know it's not the same from 0 to 5000 5000 to 10000 as it is from 10 to 15000 okay so that is a great uh, disadvantage now uh, if they have to project air power they will have to come from east of myanmar you know they have air fields uh, there which again is a different equation they will have to overfly Uh, Myanmar. Not that they can't do it. I mean, probably they won't even ask uh, that country. But it is tricky. You know, it it it's uh, it will be a little uh, complex. Now, also, uh, even if it has a huge aircraft inventory, there are two aspects which we need to keep in mind. Firstly, large number like J seven are legacy fighters. You know, almost four hundred, five hundred are into that uh, class. And secondly, main focus of China is on Eastern Front. you know every day now even today's papers are full with uh, you know usa saying somebody had questioned usa that uh, will you are helping ukraine uh, degrade your capability of uh, fighting china and there is a detailed uh, uh, discussion on that that no if you know china uh, tries to take over taiwan then usa is fully ready to uh, do that you see that so much of focus on eastern front so it is unlikely that it will move all its inventory the entire inventory and put it against uh, india in uh, you know uh, wtc it will retain significant forces uh, you know on that front how much is anyone's guess but an intelligent guess or in my opinion it will not reduce that inventory from 50% you know guarding or not giving an impression in that flank that they can do some uh, mischief there so now if that be the case if their initial pitching against us over such a large front is about 50% of their inventory then i would say we are almost at uh, par now uh, it is not that we don't have to look after western front uh, you know incidentally and we also have to look after western front but situation is not as complex uh, as in uh, that you know just to give an example uh, this gargunza airfield and sargodha are equally distant from ambala so if an aircraft is in ambala from there it can address gargunja also it can address sargodha also okay in addition to that uh, we have large number of airfields at lower altitudes you know you start i mean leave the jnk and if you start uh, scanning the border huge number of them uh, you know airfields uh, right till eastern front and at much lower altitudes that means we can carry much more uh, payload uh, we can launch many more uh, Uh, aircraft uh, from that point of view okay and what do we have in these airfields okay we have 
referred squadrons, I may not count the number of squadrons, but significant Su 30s, MiG 29s, Mirage 2000s, Jaguars, and LCA, plus only three Bison squadrons we are left with, which are relatively uh, of lesser uh, caliber than other aircraft that I counted. All in all, 30 squadrons. But you see, the point you must note is that all our legacy aircraft, like pure pure MiG-21, 23, 27, have all uh, gone out. You know, now the aircraft that we have uh, are being upgraded. You know, Jaguar is getting an upgrade. You know, the uh, Darren 3 version uh, will be very potent. MiG-29 has got upgraded. It's multi-role now. It is Earlier, it was pure a defense aircraft. Now it can, you know, launch uh, A to ground uh, weapons also. So, uh, quality of aircraft, Rafal is much superior in my opinion, even when you compare it to uh, J-20. Now, we'll not, uh, uh, you know, uh, compare each aircraft against each aircraft, but just, just a broad comparison between J-20 and uh, Rafal, you know, because that is the latest. Now, J-20 is a huge, huge aircraft, even if it's a stealth uh, capability. It's, you know, physical dimensions itself are about 20 meters length, 15 meters uh, wingspan as compared, Rafale is about 15 meters into uh, 10 meters or 10 and uh, half or 11 meters uh, or so. Okay, much smaller in size. Okay, uh, it can, uh, you know, range is similar, 2000 kilometers to about 1850 uh, kilometers. Okay. Now, the armament carrying capability is because it is stealth, it can only carry internal armament. They do not have any external, uh, you know, uh, hard points. Because it cannot carry external tanks, its internal fuel carrying capacity is almost, you know, 32,100 kg. That is why it had to be made uh, so big. But what is uh, the, that uh, done to? It reduces its thrust to weight ratio, which is about 0.92 as compared to 0.9. And nine, eight, almost one in case of uh, refer. When you come to uh, load carrying, like I said, it can either carry six missiles or about five tons of load because it all has to be uh, internal. In comparison, refer has 14 hard points, you know, variety of load you can uh, carry on that. Okay. And almost 9.5 tons. It has Spectra, EW uh, suite, SR radars, you know, uh, scalp missile, almost 540 kilometers uh, range, and Meteor uh, air to air missile. So, overall, you know, the capability that Rafale would give, and probably we will be the same or the similar class aircraft more, this capability jump uh, is a uh, hell of a lot. Air mobility, you know, uh, has improved significantly with our C-17 and our special ops capability with C-130 uh, Hercules. You see, along with these modern aircraft, we also have an advantage that we don't have to move forces uh, that much as they will have to move. Suppose they do from Eastern Front to Southern Front, you know, see the uh, area. Whereas we do have a challenge earlier, we did have a challenge, but with these aircraft induction, I think the movement will be... Uh, much faster. Apaches and Chinooks have made a big difference. We lack this capability uh, here. We have our own PMD program, you know, and induction of S-400 has uh, been a bigger, uh, very big game changer. Uh, our own homegrown Akash missile and, uh, you know, spider air defense, uh, air defense missiles have also significantly, uh, you know, improved our uh, potential, especially uh, when it comes to uh, hill areas. Brahmos is a potent weapon, accurate, decently accurate uh, weapon, and we are inducting more. We probably might be going in for a hypersonic version of a Brahmos missile. You know, recently it was announced with Mark uh, 6 capability. And Prale SSM missile, you know, they, the government has already contracted for uh, uh, many more, probably 250 uh, of them more, which will be uh, deployed. Uh, it's a tactical missile, about 500 odd kilometers range, you know, surface-to-surface uh, -surface, uh, missile, which will give a great uh, edge. Now, terrain becomes very relevant in air war. Whosoever exploits it uh, gets great advantage. Now, exact tactics are not uh, relevant here, but uh, during Doklam, you know, it was seen and when uh, we were really wargaming that how is it going to turn out, that terrain had huge uh, advantage if you uh, employed correct tactics to avoid majority of their radar than uh, air defense uh, missiles. Now, I suppose we will have an edge when it comes to uh, tactics. Now, when we talk of air war, 
it's not going to be an isolation you know it is not that everything else uh, will be on uh, you know it's not going to be like bala court probably okay that only air action uh, took place we are talking of air war in a conflict with china right so it's essentially part of the entire conflict on land and in uh, sea uh, ground for now why i am bringing this in that ground forces advance that is advance of our ground forces on ground and their ability to stop enemy advance is also of importance you know that is that is what will dictate uh, also the uh, conflict's result now how effective is air power will also be determined by how effectively can it aid own forces to advance and stop the enemy forces from doing the same mm. and what would be their air force doing essentially the same thing so air war becomes important from a standpoint that it does not allow the enemy air force to interfere with our ground forces you know let's say take a case that you take our air force out of equation if it's on ground the enemy air can play hell into ground forces i mean it's not only going to target our air fields or our air force installation air force will target anything which is uh, visible and like you know enemy right there at the border is a very very uh, lucrative uh, target so air war has to contain that enemy air so that it does not interfere with the uh, ground forces now careful study of chinese topography reveals a few points on a large number of interdiction targets if you look at chinese uh, area i am talking of with respect to our strengths and their weak points you know how we can uh, address that now if you have these interdiction targets carefully selected and analyzed movement of nap troops can be hindered very effectively and that is where our air force with precision capability can really uh, you know play very very important average elevation of the tibetan plateau is about 14000 feet you know varying from 3 kilometers to 5 kilometers now the altitude is one thing see how it plays out in war you know let's say enemy is advancing especially in winter now they are not in one day or during sunlight going to cover everything you know they are stopping at night everywhere stopping what i mean to say some camping some uh, togetherness some concentration at some places it's all out in the open you know mm-hmm. they they do not have shadows they do not have hiding points okay and at 14000 feet in biting cold lying in the open uh, you uh, the air force can really play havoc into that i mean you know it's uh, to anyone's imagination that what can air force do and so your air equation with the enemy air force becomes very very relevant because if the enemy air force does not let you do that then your air power is in effect so if my air force is able to contain enemy air and able to take on these kind of you know uh, enemy advances then then it is achieving a great amount of uh, goal or uh, aim now uh, there are many choke points like i said you know which can be destroyed very significantly they will slow down uh, their movement you just need to identify them now when i say you need to identify them it needs a hard work you know it will need very very credible isr when we come to that capability we will see uh, what do we have you know it's not a gamble it's not that i just look at map and say okay take out that bridge take out that bridge take out that bridge <laughs> without re- really analyzing that uh, of what importance it is to the enemy you have to continuously watch what kind of you know uh, gaming are they doing what kind of movements are they practicing uh, what kind of infrastructure is building up where uh, you know where are more Uh, uh, probably t points are coming up on road you know all these things are indicative you know if i suddenly find on a road more kind of you know infrastructure coming up more guest houses coming up or more dabas like this coming up it it indicates that probably this is a preferred access of uh, movement so int to that an extent will have to be uh, analyzed if you want to achieve these effects now because we are talking of achieving more with less okay if that has to be done then you have to pump in lot of effort uh, in these uh, kind of domains now uh, effect of rocket force you know their effect of rocket force destroying our critical air fields like lay or thois you know initially this was a big worry beyond zojila you had these two major air fields lay and thois and it was generally uh, you know always uh, felt that if two air fields are taken out of equation then how are you going to land up your supplies or you know people a- into that area 
now you know we have woken up uh, and this zojila tunnel and atal tunnel and all this infrastructure improving has quite significantly reduced that effect you know your supplies or your critical supplies at least will not be uh, any hindrance uh, even if they their fields were to uh, be rendered ineffective uh, for a uh, little while now winning a war uh, you know is defined by what objectives you set right uh, i am sure china must be evaluating indian air force probably more than what we do indian air force's objective against china would be uh, to create credible deterrence that it does not risk a confrontation in air in my uh, opinion if you have that kind of deterrence that they evaluate and they say it's not really worth confronting uh, air force you know then you have really uh, to some an extent achieved your aim okay uh, and if it does confront then it must uh, suffer a humiliating uh, losses i won't say that you will run over it or you will decimate it or you will completely destroy it if chinese air force suffers humiliating losses against indian uh, you know confrontation then it will not uh, risk it and why i'm saying you know we have seen doklam this is now my personal reading we have seen dokla we have seen gilwan now in my opinion like i say if china had a slightest feeling that air force can or air element can help it achieve a quick outcome probably it would have certainly introduced an air element in some form you know whatever be it the very fact that it did not is a testimony that iaf was able to create credible deterrence so they remained restricted only to ground skirmishes and uh, you know they did not venture into that now they say they feared escalation the very fact they feared escalation why did they fear escalation because they know that it will escalate if indian air force did not have that capability to escalate then they wouldn't fear you know why why do they why did they in uh, intrude why did they come in because they thought that is the domain where probably to some an extent they can contain and there will be no escalation but in if they did not bring an air element and fearing escalation that means there is a credible deterrence uh, available you know while i say that we need to wake up you know why we need to wake up because this is the equation as of now the gap is increasing and china is working very hard to increase uh, you know this gap the situation may change tomorrow and the moment it feels that it has created sufficient differential with respect to the iaf the next skirmish probably will come in the air this is my you know personal opinion so we need to avoid and prevent that situation and uh, you know close the gap and, and uh, not at all allow that uh, gap to uh, increase so what do we need to do to uh, you know to do this to close this gap or to uh, wake up like we say we definitely need to increase our fighter squadron strength to 42 there is no doubt about it the chief of air staff in every forum he is not let go of any forum in which he did not highlight that we need to increase the squadron strength to uh, 42 sooner the better okay the class of aircraft that we are looking at i am not saying government is not doing they we already contracted for 83 uh lca mark 1 is mark 2 is on mk we are talking of okay but this needs to be done fast more and more capable uh, uavs need to come up you know we are again shying away um, uh, on that front you know our tapas our ghatak our uh, various things are lagging uh, way behind and china has got lot uh, inventory now i am talking of credible uavs i am not talking of these small quadcopters which are in uh, large uh, quantity they will play their own role but we are talking of credible uh, uavs we need to increase our isr capability you know which is uh, which is low in my opinion as of now because we do not we have limited satellites we have limited uavs and we have you don't uh, get enough of uh, surveillance with fighter aircraft you know fighters can do recce but you don't get surveillance for surveillance you need persistent surveillance you need a hail class of aircraft you know which can hang around there for 20 30 hours and continuously watch uh, what's mm-hmm. happening we mm-hmm. we don't have that uh, capability which needs to come up you know every now and then we we don't uh, we can't uh, uh, you know depend on others to give us uh, some wind and satellites have their own 
uh, limitations you know they don't provide you real time event they have their revisits time they have you know different uh, game when we talk of space probably uh, we will we'll we'll talk sir. about that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay then evax and refuters you know dismal low uh, quantity now you see just to give an example and uh, uh, you know for f35 uh, usa is developing a new engine technology new engine technology not so much to prove very great extra thrust but to for the low fuel consumption and the hypothesis given is they are they are fearing they say they have painted a scenario that they have to they have to launch you know uh, a number of f35s from guam for you know china uh, contingency let's say and he says in the current scenario those number of f35s they will need some 17 or 20 refuelers to sustain that fleet so they need greater fuel uh, efficiency so that these refuelers come down to about 7 or 8 you know th- this is this is the thinking and now uh, they they have you know large number of refuelers or evacs and we uh, comparatively don't have uh, that many we need to induct more we need to build more something needs to be done uh, in this uh, category hal and drdo need to push projects you know cag report is in public domain was very critical of lot of hal projects which have been hanging specifically project by project he has you know they have pointed out what kind of delays uh, have taken place people can open up uh, on google and see for uh, themselves but the fact is that they need to really uh, push you know whatever they take they must bring it up and you know produce rather than keep taking future projects and uh, you know putting uh, earlier ones in the cold uh, burner okay counter uavs is an aberration of we did full episode uh, on uh, uavs i don't want to go over again but what happens is along with see while when i talk of credible uavs okay we need to develop that but you have to counter for nuisance of the enemy you know i may not create nuisance myself but i must counter enemy's nuisance tomorrow mm-hmm. while i am you know planning a very large operation here and there and some small uh, thing keeps uh, uh, irritating you like few mosquitoes in the room you need to have some defense against that now they are not going to kill you immediately or they they are not uh, you know doing but they are irritating okay so counter us capability is something we need to invest very heavily on we are probably not thinking so much in that you know various whether it is uh, rf jamming whether it is laser whether it is hpm or whether it is physical capture uh, you know by the uh, various means this is something uh, which needs to uh, come up eight wave missiles you know you we just saw the pl uh, story and where have they reached we unfortunately are still struggling with astra you know which probably will come up uh, in a while and we are heavily dependent on uh, eight wave missile inventory uh, from abroad so we we need to quickly have because when you have to launch them in numbers in large numbers uh, we need to have production capability otherwise how will you uh, match up surface to surface missiles like you know we are paying attention on that but this inventory needs to uh, again uh, catch up uh, more number of lgas uh, need to quickly come up and our space presence also needs to increase you know we need to push more Uh, as compared to you know 22 itself they china launched 64 satellites they have about 500 satellites all over as compared to we have launched about four or five on we are not talking of uh, the small satellites which have now or some educational satellites the meaningful uh, satellites and lastly uh, you know these technologies like hypersonic technology artificial intelligence and cyber domains we need to work on that now I, again you know while we have talked of air war let's be pragmatic about it the war will in with china will not uh, uh, be completely in the physical uh, domain you know it will start with cyber operations it will start with some uh, you know targeting your cognitive abilities it will start in artificial uh, intelligence domain and uh, uda loop like we say you know earlier sensor to shooter is what we used to talk about but now observe orient decide and act this uda loop it it has to be shortened all these uh, uh, technologies are of uh, utmost important uh, i think we need to uh, definitely uh, work uh, very very you know uh, fast pace uh, on this i think we covered a lot of grounds taken lot of time but i thought it was important to cover overall aspect uh, i should stop here i got carried away probably with air war no uh, no sir i think you know uh, what you've done is given a very 
great roundup, and that is something yeah. I think uh, has been missing because we've talked about this, that, this, that in different different aspects of it in multiple episodes and you know uh, in multiple different things. This was a good roundup of the actual situation, or right, or the tactical yeah. situation between India and China. So that is very critical. Uh, so the only question I have, and of course after that I'll break out into the this thing into the audience questions you mentioned the rocket forces and that's something which i keep wondering about because uh, you've covered uh, uh, the types of fighters of china which is a great this thing and we all know that the chinese have of course large 2300 or 1800 or 2000 fighters that's debatable uh, they keep about 150 200 towards the russian borders at all times they yeah. they they don't want to move them from there even in spite of the no limits relationships and this and that. So, you know, when we look at the number to number, you brought out a very interesting point that 2,300 versus 6,700 700 that we've got, it's not really all versus all. It's going to be a, you know, very different battle. So the question that I have with regards to the rocket forces is that, you know, I read some commentary some time ago. Personally, I did agree with it, but I really want your comment that the Chinese have so many rockets to hit our airfields. And uh, you mentioned that we have a string of airfields and stuff like that. So that is, of course, our advantage that the Indian Air Force is a bit more mobile and capability of, mob you know, mobility of the Indian Air Force is much higher. Having said that, sir, the damage to the airfield, I mean, is it actually possible to stop an air operations? You mentioned it about Lay and Thois. What kind of a, uh, damage can they actually do with their rocket forces? And how far is that damage actually sustainable, sir? See, uh, when we talk of rocket force, uh, you know, there is a lot of literature on that. But uh, briefly, I'll, I'll uh, answer your question. Now, what are the kind of missiles? Rocket force, essentially, when, you know, one, one uh, another aspect that we have left out of the equation is their cruise missiles. Okay, there are a lot of cruise missiles uh, also available. But people generally focus on rocket force because that is what has been made out to be huge, uh, a big thing. Okay, so let's talk of uh, uh, rocket force. Uh, now, just imagine, let's say there is a DF-31. It uh, The range is 11,200 kilometers. Okay, unlikely that China will use it against India. You know, it is meant for different kind of uh, targets. Actually, the rockets, when China developed rockets, he did not develop these rocket force for airfields of India. You know, this is the byproduct now that it will end up using. They were actually built for the carrier force of USA. You know, they wanted to sink their carriers that this rocket force, you know, if you see their uh, uh, warhead construction, if you see their uh, the capability it is not ideally suited for uh, digging holes on the runway. You know, the kind of uh, CP they will dig a hole, I'm not denying that. But the fact is there, were, there could have been more economical ways to do it. Okay, but anyway, now that they have this, I think the two kinds of missiles which may come up against us is DF-21 class with 1500 to 2000 uh, kilometers of range and DF-15 with about 700 to 800 kilometers of range. Even DF-26, you know, 3000 to 4000 kilometers or DF-31 or DF-41, uh, you know, 12000 to 15000, probably we can take them out of the equation. They may be nuclear armed against, you know, different uh, countries. But like we said, we take the nuclear equation out of it. In this particular thing, what inventory of DF-15 and DF-21 will they have and how much will they uh, fire against uh, India? It is uh, an analysis that brought out that even if they were to fire their full inventory, and I'm saying now taking a chance that they pull out all their missiles towards India, they will be able to put down a, some small number of airfields, difficult to quantify, 4 or 6 or 8 or uh, 9 or 10 for a limited period of time. Now, what we need to do, you know, either you start intercepting each incoming missile, which is not possible. At the same time, you have to build up your passive defense capability. Okay, that means you have to build up capability in two forms. You know, your all critical infrastructure, like your command control centers, your aircrafts, have to be under hardened shelters. We are doing well in that. You know, a lot of hardened shelters are coming up, okay? Now, uh, and the runway, uh, re, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitation schemes, there are many modern technologies available now. In quick time, uh, you know, they build up your uh, runway. It's not a standard MES, you know, keep churning that cement and, uh, you know, sand in some proportions and lay it and, uh, you know, takes long uh, time to do that. Okay. 
so if we build up if we focus on building up uh, our rehabilitation scheme or uh, creating enough passive uh, air defense uh, then probably we can look after uh, this threat uh, to quite an extent and another point is after all they are going to be fired from some place no they are not coming out of space so if i have surface to surface missile capability and credible a uh, surveillance and reconnaissance capability then those sites can also be targeted they may be mobile to an extent but not that they cannot be targeted provided i have a sufficient quantity of uh, surface to surface missiles in case i don't want to uh, risk my fighters but even with fighters with long range missiles like we are saying scalp etc taking terrain advantage making your tactical routing etc it is possible to pop up and avoid uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, detection for some time and target uh, those sites so why they are of concern i am not saying close your eyes from that uh, threat but it is not that it is insurmountable you know you can you need to be concerned about it not greatly worried uh, to lose sleep yes take measures to do that like i said build up your rehabilitation capability and uh, have enough uh, shelters available for this then probably this threat can be uh, looked after to a uh, great extent interesting and see that that's the whole thing so when we look at it a little bit more pragmatically uh, it, it makes a little more sense and uh, thank you for actually bringing that out because it's about a realism factor i mean how much can china bring to bear with regards to this thing and of course the factor that you spoke about escalation brought me to that point in when the chinese started doing some exercise air exercise in ladakh and when we did a counter exercise there was an official statement that no 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 let's please back off let's yeah. not you know so that tells you that they they they've got a certain nervousness about the indian air force which is very interesting uh coming out uh, let's take uh, some questions there are loads of comments there are about 160 people watching us at the moment oh uh, that's good guys please like and subscribe the video uh, subscribe subscribe and please make sure that you you know uh, share it with your friends this is a very important video and i must thank the air marshal because he's brought out a very interesting aspect of it it's it's a very realistic aspect of it he's not saying ki hum tod denge and all that stuff there is a real threat from china but we can counter it at the moment and of course going into the future we have to do work to bring about the you know the deterrence factor as he brought about very lucidly so please like subscribe and if you do want to help out the dev talks efforts the qr code is right up here or you can just send us a super sticker or super chat thank you so much Let's get into some questions, sir. Uh, Ishan, thanks for your contribution. Uh, Jayan, sir, how are reverse engineering capabilities progressing, especially in regards to engine design? Uh, thank you, Ishan. I don't think we are doing any reverse engineering, in my opinion. We are just trying to build engine capability, and you are very right in your observation. This is one capability we need to somehow uh, get. You know, a, because if you don't have Uh, your own homegrown engine and the very development of uh, future fighter aircraft uh, is in uh, uh, question uh, the government needs to give solid push you know our iitms are what capability you have there is a lot of work happening in gtre you know our uh, organization which does research on uh, gas turbine research uh, establishment okay uh, so but there is a lot of ground to cover we we lack uh, metallurgy capability you know the uh, the material which can withstand those kind of turbine uh, temperatures and lot of uh, other issues but i doubt whether we have reverse engineering we will probably need to collaborate with uh, some countries to start with uh, and slowly acquire this uh, uh, capability navin thanks so much for your contribution say sir sir thank you for this exhaustive uh, comparison of air power between india and china uh can you also provide some commentary on the relative parity with regards to drone and what drones would play in a war like scenario uh navin we've also done that video as i uh, mentioned sir would you like to make a small short comment on oh on yes uh, yes you know drone sir like i said you know china has huge uh, inventory of uh, drones you know and uh, you know wing lung is uh, famous so their uh, uh, other uh, chi i i mean uh, 
uh, rainbow uh, is one you know the uh, this dgi is very famous a small uh, thing which keeps going around now without counting the uh, nomenclature of drones india definitely lacks uh, that capability we need to uh, build that capability uh, and i said so in my talk how the drones will play they will play a significant role you know anybody who's watching russia ukraine war in whatever form cannot uh, uh, cannot deny the fact the kind of yeah. uh, role that they can play but all i can say is they by themselves will not be able to uh, bring out outcome of a, a war they would have done it by now they can augment it augment it if used uh, correctly okay uh, the cost uh, becomes a very very uh, great issue you, you see uh, uh, the bayraptors uh, started getting used uh, to start with very costly piece you know it had great effect in uh, destroying the russian uh, uh, infrastructure uh, because their air defenses were not up to it moment their air defenses came uh, up to the mark they, they just disappeared from the scene okay <laughs> and now there are cheaper versions coming now kamakazi drones are uh, coming you know which are of uh, use but just see what will this drone do this drone can you know uh, drop a bomb or a missile over a tank uh over uh, let's say some critical infrastructure swarm attack can do lot of uh, damage but if i want to take on an interdiction target uh, a bridge for example can drone do that not yet in my opinion okay you will need hard power you will need fire power unleashed by uh, you know aircraft a, a tons and tons of load not by one aircraft by a number of aircraft or surface to surface missiles okay that is the war equation these small uh, uh, battles or a you know theater uh, battles they will have a uh, lot and you know why they are becoming important is in our day to day they are irritating uh, us you know in peace time they have more uh, have to do during peace time than war time i have a uh, feeling that in a full fledged war you know where armies are clashing with each other the uh, air war crashing each other drones probably will find uh, some kind of uh, hard to uh, have their uh, uh, you know uh, legitimate place you know they will uh, they will target your uh, air defense sites they will target your critical infrastructure they will target your uh, concentration uh, uh, camps etc kamakazi drones especially in large numbers so you need to develop counter uh, drone capability uh, like i uh, said but before that india definitely needs to uh, speed up and build up its uh, credible drone uh, not drone uav capability no shucks in that sir uh thanks sir does the if have strategic bombers if not do we need one uh, see the uh, we do not have any strategic uh, bomber as such after canberra we do not have any uh, strict bomber class of uh, a, uh, you know aircraft but we have uh, sufficient range provided by su30 especially with the uh, aerial to air uh, air to air refueling you know we have done exercises where aircraft got able from pune that did a bombing mission in andaman nicobar island and uh, done okay now that is uh, as strategic as you can uh, get but but what happens is what you mean by strategic bomber is that load carrying capacity obviously is yeah. much more yeah. uh then if it is you know if it is not required to maneuver or it is not required to uh, you know carry other uh, stuff h6 for uh, example you know uh, chinese bomber you know strategic bomber okay it can carry uh, so many uh, cruise missiles which is a, a great uh, load carrying capability uh, of the uh, normal bombers b52 b2 if you see i i saw one b52 in one of the museums it's uh, like a football ground you know you can uh, probably do <laughs> Uh, your ten thousand steps on its wings. You know, not not joking. I know it's from one <laughs> end to the other. No, th that's a different league. But does India need it? I would say that not over uh, the fighters. Uh, you know, our critical strength today is the shortage of fighters. You know, we are saying thirty squadrons. We need to build up to forty-two. Now, do we leave the fighter program and uh, start going in for uh, a bomber? and uh, no point uh, purchasing a bomber uh, again you know one or two or three will not add much of a punch as probably a, another fighter squadron of rafale or uh, or a similar class of uh, aircraft sir godrej is now producing dry cavalry engine without afterburner this is heartening news as it will give our industry a chance to develop higher thrust engines what's your take on that 
yes definitely like i said you know uh, this is uh, this is a work in uh, uh, progress but uh, you know what happens is small engines uh, uh, production uh, dry thrust uh, is a welcome step because ultimately uh, like i said you know uh, what is the what is holding us is that metallurgy because the metal is not able to take that or the turbine is not able to take temperature temperature produced by afterburner you know the when after burner burns it the temperature is uh, very high okay probably to a lower end you can uh, develop that and open metallurgy improves you will be able to make those blades which can withstand those kind of uh, uh, temperatures that is what we need because you see what are what am i going to make now i'm not going to uh, make small aircraft yes uh, uh, you know that is where it will work but if my target is producing future fighters mka what we are talking of okay you probably need an engine for that class of aircraft you know this is where we need to work seriously hard this is definitely a step in the right direction there is no denying this is how the progress uh, happens but what i'm saying somehow i don't know what needs to be done uh, you know i don't know say uh, uh, unfair means but something needs to be done definitely to get this uh, particular technology absolutely sir even if it is unfair chal kapat yeah uh, whatever i'm not propagating that but if it happens fair <laughs> enough i won't i won't yeah. oppose it <laughs> yeah so let's be politically correct here uh so yes. ishan thanks so much once again sir another question chinese were recruiting ex british air force pilots as instruct- instructors is this because they realized they outmatched and outskilled by the indian air force pilots uh, you know they, this made uh, huge news and i believe all those guys uh, have been charged uh, with treason or something you know these british pilots uh, i mean treason may be wrong word but i am saying they were taken to task and uh, it very strict instructions went that nobody will uh, take this kind of employment they paid huge money you know the money is not an issue like we say the kind of defense budget or kind of uh, Uh, things or the otherwise money they have for such kind of thing their aim probably was if you remember the aspect that i highlighted that they have very less experience of international exercises they recruited these pilots basically to get those tactics because these pilots had exercised all over the world they have taken part in not only exercise they have taken part in live uh, uh, campaigns they have taken part in iraq in afghanistan as nato forces you know in syria and libya you name it so they took these pilots by paying huge money Uh, basically i guess to train their uh, own pilots uh, to rise uh, uh, as an air force in capability i mean it it may be a little uh, uh, too uh, f- flattering to say that fearing indian air force they recruited those british pilots uh, that uh, i don't know how far will that be true but uh, leave fearing indian air force it is just to improve their capability or to address that weak point you know which now appears as a weak point that their tactics or their ability to uh, do modern things uh, is lacking it is to plug that gap uh, that they recruited these pilots so i'm going to request you for another 10 or 12 minutes more we've got some interesting questions Please. if we could Anything. address yeah. them i think this will be a yes. well rounded discussion sir uh, navin thanks so much uh, so how relevant is the capability to ability to have air power on the blue seas is it relevant in an india china conflicts what is the relative standing see they uh, now when we uh, talk of that uh, now i am not getting into uh, the naval parity uh, of it but you see uh, air power into the blue sea essentially if you are talking of carriers then you know uh, probably they will have in the times to come more carriers than we have you know they are planning some five carriers by 2030 or something we are Uh, having two and probably a third will uh, come up but what do you get on that you know they they will have j20 uh, uh, version naval version they will have uh, aircraft and we probably have mc29 uh, as of now okay lca uh, version will come up and some uh, more will come up now if you talk of relevant i don't really know how to call it irrelevant you know any air power uh, if tomorrow your naval fleet uh, is going to be threatened uh, uh, from the sea then it will probably make some sense to have some air power uh, in the sea okay the uh, question is that your shore reach is not the only issue you know earlier we used to give this also uh, as a reason that uh, uh, you can reach anywhere i just gave you example from pune to uh, andaman nicobar that you can reach from anywhere then why uh, have a carrier in front 
probably time will become a factor you know you can reach but in how much uh, time uh, can you uh, reach okay also the that is extension of arm extension of arm of operation also will be a extension of arm of operation yes i mean how, how far can you uh, project that but there yeah. is a critical aspect there critical aspect there is that protection of that whole thing you know which opens up a second uh, debate so if we just uh, leave it to the air aspects then okay just just leave the sea part of it let's say it was ground it was surface right? there is no water it was land then if someone asks would you like an airfield there what will i say is it relevant or not relevant it's as simple as that Absolutely. you know today we are today we are uh, you know when we said that we have less say uh, you know we were vulnerable in the uh, eastern sector or on the northern sector rather uh, in lay thoi sector because of uh, the jila becoming uh, a problem we started you know building uh, what do you call highways uh, as alternate airfields you know there are 3 kilometers uh, stretches at places now and they are built to that class uh, where you can land uh, a fighter okay so you what are you doing you are increasing your flexibility you are increasing your reach so this debate of sea or land uh, from that point of view becomes irrelevant it is that how far can i put my aircraft is will always remain uh, relevant uh, from that point of view. This is an interesting one when we are not able to achieve a 42 squadron strength. Rahul asks, uh, how, as I have calculated, it requires 42 squadron strength. Why not more than 42 or less than 42? Uh, how is it 42 numbers? And any updates on MMRCA 2.0, sir? Yeah, see, uh, firstly, 42. You know, uh, you the, the uh, what should I say? The warfighters or the planners probably worked on a uh, template you know they worked on a template that we need to uh, have the strength of 42 squadron from different you know there are two aspects uh, that what do you uh, what can you have okay uh, let me draw a very simple analogy okay you have a place uh, how much do you put in that place is number one what is required and number two how much can you uh, place Let's say if someone today became very benevolent, I'm um, just for hypothetical case that okay, have hundred fighter squadrons. So can India uh, uh, absorb hundred fighter squadrons? So why not more? Why not less? It, it becomes relevant there that okay, I'm not saying why not forty four or why uh, why not forty? Not that close an equation. Okay, that that will always remain debatable. Forty two has been the figure achieved at uh, by certain calculations by taking some firepower into consideration by taking the number of targeting now uh, uh, we are not getting deep into tactics but the air forces or the uh, forces continuously keep updating their target folders you know that what do they need to address in how much time etc etc and then you have an otr kind of thing you know over the target requirement that what is your over the target requirement with each class of aircraft. And then if I envisage a particular kind of war and I say, okay, if this has to open up now, we have not talked of two front war. Okay. Take the tomorrow scenario that if there is a two fronts open up, okay, then I need to have some kind of balance. Now, how much can I sustain on my airfields uh, is also a, a point of view. How much armament do I have? Okay. Tomorrow, uh, if I have huge number of aircraft and not the corresponding missiles, then I'm not going to send aircraft up in the air unarmed. Balance. You will only yeah, you will only need to strike balance. That what is your capacity to absorb the number of forums that uh, you are talking of, and what is going to give you a decent uh, punch. So no hard, uh, no I mean no great logic that I can provide for a fixed number 42. 40. After all, we are. Uh, doing okay with 30 also okay but and we are planning to 42 but what happens is it's a figure which has been worked out otherwise what exactly would you tell government if they ask you okay how many squadrons you want you have to work on some template so this is how the 42 has been achieved uh, arrived there is no magic figure or there is no numerology in uh, 42 i would say it's a had an interesting consideration uh, one the, yeah one of the viewers has an interesting comment 42 is the answer to life and the universe for everything in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So that's a, that's an interesting, uh, oh, great. Just a, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. sort of a, this thing. Uh, there is always another uh, point. Yeah. A couple of, uh, of questions more. So yeah. how do we know China's advanced capabilities? It's just their claims. 
most buyers of Chinese inventory are struggling. How do we believe anything coming out of China? Excellent and fudging data. Okay, good question. Now you see, we all have been saying that China, okay, we very few people uh, know how to read Mandarin. You know, uh, now there is a, I read the other day that there is a, in phase four, you know, we have done a MOU, uh, we have uh, done a MOU with the university to learn Mandarin, you know, so that you can reach actual what is happening in that country. Otherwise, uh, you don't know. So when we want to uh, get in our comfort zone, I would say that, okay, I don't want to believe Chinese technology or advancement too much. I would say that, oh, you don't believe that, you know, uh, they, they could be telling lies. How do I believe uh, what is coming? But the point is, look at the technology they have demonstrated. You know, if they have established a space station, okay, they have established a hypersonic, they have just launched a FOGS. Now, these are not fictions. This is this involves great technology. So if this technology is available and they have demonstrated, there is no reason that I don't believe that they don't have other technologies. Uh, uh, what they say, I presume that if they say, and if the reasonable int says that this kind of technology is available, then I suppose it must be available because they have demonstrated technology to the uh, world that this is what we are uh, capable of. What about specifically talking about the Chinese aircraft like the JF-17 and all these which are facing See, trouble, sir. What, a, what a, you... Like you said, yeah, that, you know, because they are reverse engineered, you know, we are talking of that, okay. The uh, a copy will always, the FAQ will always uh, remain short of the uh, uh, original, you know. Also, you see, the That's very... A... Uh, hmm? Yeah, the copy the can't very... be as good as the original, sir. Mm. Original, okay. Now, even even otherwise, you see, uh, you see Rafale aircraft or you see Mirage 2000, okay? It's a pleasure to walk around the aircraft, okay? I have not walked around 820, but when you see it closely, there are, it's not as sleek or as, uh, I would say, good to look at. You know, uh, it's, it does not give you that feeling uh, of a, uh, you know, I, I, uh, what should I say, like a, Beloved, you know that okay. This is you know. I remember uh, we were told that uh, when we were youngsters, good instructors would say that you know, walk around the aircraft. It will tell you. It will talk to you. You know, you should feel good about walking around the aircraft. And you do it around Mirage 2000. I tell you, it's a treat. Okay, you were a is uh, even more so. Yeah, so this is this is from the point of view of technology, original technology. You know, when you uh, do that reverse engineering or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, then uh, uh, there are problems. And yes, technology to some extent, you see what is not demonstrated is for everyone to see. Take the case of operating system. You know, Apple still is invented in America. You know, they they have uh, uh, operating system is still Windows uh, and Mac. Okay. They have their Kylin system, you know, K-Y-L-I-N, whatever way you uh, They've been trying it. to switch it over the past yeah. one decade. No, They've no, not been able to do Yeah, it. not possible. Their government and military uses it because of security or whatever it is, but not popular uh, yeah, in no. uh, thing. So Even this the is navigation, the, the, navigation is yeah. much to be desired. There have been issues. Though they, uh, again, you know, they uh, now you, uh, you, you see, you have to uh, probably fire a weapon using that uh, technology to see how accurate uh, <laughs> it is. But like we said, they have that satellites behave in the same manner. I suppose if it's the way... Bedu satellite behave in the same manner as a GPS satellite would behave. So the accuracy should be close by. Problem may be in the processing. You see, what happens is satellites will give you uh, information. Now, how that information is being processed is probably uh, where the uh, problem uh, may lie if there is any uh, shortcoming. So right. there are issues. You know, th this is what uh, when you don't uh, start development or you reverse engineer somewhere, you are. Uh, going to uh, yeah, feel the uh, block. Right way is to do things uh, the right way, but then like in a race, you know, uh, when it's war, then they say there are no runners up in war, you know, you have to win. Uh, so it's only the winner. So whatever it takes to win the war, people will uh, try to uh, do that. So let's close this discussion with a very, very well-rounded question. Naveen, thank you so much for this. Uh, uh, sir, you preface that the analysis is based on defense capabilities. Can you provide some high-level commentary on the other factors and how re relevant they'll be 
geopolitics allies see root weaknesses and other nuclear options see they uh, like nuclear options we can believe like i told you i would i'm a firm believer that okay uh, if the two countries have a no first use policy in this case india and china that none will use uh, nuclear weapons they don't even say that uh, i will use nuclear weapon in if some red line is crossed etc 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 like it's anybody's guess you know tomorrow any trigger happy guy or you are uh, actually you have an existential threat all together uh, what happens but i will discount it uh, for that time being geopolitics you know uh, again i am not a uh, very uh, but i uh, a great scholar in that aspect but i will tell you it it can play Uh, a role, you know, we have started that quad is happening. One thing in 2011, you know, I was doing NDC, uh, National Defence College here in Delhi. We went on a tour to Singapore, and we went in their university for a talk. There was a professor there way back in 2011 when this area discussion came up. He made a mention. He said, in this area in Asia, this part of Asia, India has lot of trust surplus. There is there is lot of trust deficit. Uh, towards uh, deficit towards china okay it is visible now all the countries small small countries that china is invested in through bri etc etc by loaning them you see the its uh, behavior how it does you know it traps people it's not helping those guys it's trapping them you know the debt trap etc so that they they can't go uh, out of that place now this is how geopolitics uh, may play but at the same time it has just been able to break a peace uh, deal between uh, saudi arabia and iran you see it it's also playing its uh, geopolitics uh, card well and lot of people are looking towards china whether it can uh, bring an end to you know uh, russia ukraine uh, or it it's playing its cards uh, uh, differently it's bothered about geopolitics it's bothered about how the world is going to look at it and that is why he is not yet helped russia formally you know there are reports in washington post or the guardian etc that china has been supplying some weapons etc but it has not said it with the open uh, boldness that yes here the way nato is helping ukraine china is not helping russia okay so why is it not doing so because it is bothered about uh, geo uh, politics it is very he is very uh, he knows very well probably that uh, if it forces not forces if it impresses upon or convinces russia to now withdraw let's say from uh, not only ukraine's current uh, occupancy but let's say crimea or other places the questions will quickly come on uh, you know other xinjiang region and tibet region and etc etc you know how it going to handle uh, that okay so this is how the geopolitics will probably play other uh, 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 other routes like sea routes etc i mean essentially uh, the naval power in adequacies i'm sure navy is uh, looking at uh, it but few important aspects which will play a role we did not touch about much is you know the war probably will not be only in this uh, uh, like we said physical fields you know it will it may open up with cyber war there will be artificial intelligence playing a great role hypersonics will be playing a great role cyber will be playing a great role you know you can build large amount of capability in space you can build large amount of capability in any field but if you do not protect the cyber that enables it all that capability is going to be uh, waste in my opinion so cyber is one thing again that india needs to pay a lot of attention you know there is a uh, there are a lot of interesting accounts you know people build hypotheses people uh, do whole lot of things that what uh, cyber can do Uh, okay artificial intelligence now you see so much input is going to be available to you you i uh, to, just now i said that okay build up isr capability okay tomorrow let's say we have a huge isr capability in one day i am able to get 1 million pictures of various places around the world now what do i do with it how do i make out what is happening where processing yeah. of it processing of data you know how do i take decisions decision tomorrow is not going to be in black and white is not between heads and tails decision will be one in thousand options there will be thousand options available in front of you and you have to exercise one how are you going to arrive at that you know not by just tossing the coin it will be uh, it has to be considered credible that is where your processing your quantum computing you know your quantum technology and i am happy to note that you know government has announced national quantum mission you know at 6500 crores uh, yesterday yes. only 
18 hours after you and I had a conversation about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just 18 hours Absolutely. after you and I spoke about it. Really yeah, crazy. yeah. And I, I, day before, you know, there was a seminar and center for air power studies, and I had spoken about these technologies there. And I made it a mention to DG Caps uh, immediately after that. I said, "Sir, very timely talk because uh, uh, it was just announced after that." So all these things are uh, important, you know, which we need to build up capability. We did not talk about that because we are focusing on air war. Maybe some dedicated uh, session on these emerging technologies because each one is a, a field in its uh, own, and what what needs to be done, uh, a lot can be said about it. Oh, absolutely, sir. Trust me, there are two three guys in the audience are saying when a, when is the next session? So <laughs> this is something that we need to plan. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, and I'm going to leave a teaser right here, guys. You know, the next session that I'm going to ask the marshal to confirm and to clarify for us is the myth of surveillance. You know, we talk about satellite. We don't know why we can take a picture. Drone is rolled. Why can't we take a picture? What is What is the actual myth? What is the reality of surveillance? ISR that we talk about uh, is something that we need to understand a little more deeply for us to actually know the reality. You know, because there there are there are loads of myths. Especially built up by these damn movies that there's a satellite tweet, tweet, and it just lands up and suddenly taking photographs, looking at people's what is there in his pocket and this and that. Is that even realistically possible or not? Even with the best of technologies in the world, so that's something I'm going to you know request the Air Marshal to come and give us a better understanding of this particular thing. But sir, this one has been brilliant. Let me assure you, a lot of uh, people have enjoyed the show. I personally have learned a lot. Uh, it's it's a it's a great. Thing to speak beyond the rhetoric, and that's what you've done. I'd like to con congratulate you for that. Uh, thank you so much thank for so much. taking the time out, sir. All of you guys, mm -hmm. wonderful that all of you could actually join. Uh, sir, once again, thank you. Until next time, Jai Hind. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be with you, Adi. And uh, thank you for uh, to all the audience for patient uh, hearing. And uh, thanks for all this brilliant question. I must say you were very intelligent. Uh, audience and it's very stimulating you know it's uh, one feels very good uh, when you have such questions coming up uh, after the session motivates me to be on your show uh, much more thank you so much ali it's a uh, pleasure you. like i said